This is the Trading Psychology Podcast. This is VP, creator of No Nonsense Forex and author of the book No Nonsense Forex Trading Psychology. And with me, as he is every week, it is the head of trading in Maverick Currencies. It is the resilient Rob Reinhold. Thank you, Patrick. And you know, you've said a lot of adjectives about me, and not many of them have been true, but resilient. Yes, I will own that one. I have been resilient. And look, anyone who gets into their later years, it just life is tough sometimes. And life, you get scars, you get wounds. So I think anyone who gets into their 40s and 50s, they have to be resilient just to survive. I personally think effervescent was spot on, but we'll move on. So uh, as everybody knows, what we're doing right now is a, it's actually going to be a three-part series of psychological advantages and disadvantages of trading, but which markets. So last week, we went over Forex. And you guys have heard me say all the time, I think you should absolutely be trading, all of you should be trading Forex and metals and crypto. Now, whether you want to make the move to something like stocks, that's a big question. This is probably the number one question I used to get on my channel. In the YouTube comments section is, can I use this for stocks? So there's a lot of stock traders out there. There's a lot of potential future stock traders out there. Now, um, as you know, we have, since we have Rob on the show, as somebody who has not only traded stocks for a long time, but also dealt with so many stock traders over the years, we thought this would be a really good episode to go over the differences between the two and some of the unexpected psychological hurdles that you might encounter while trading stocks. And then also some of the advantages, some of the things where trading stocks is actually superior to trading those other markets, if this is even possible. We're going to find out. So Rob, as we often do here, go ahead and kick us off and I'll jump in where I can. I don't know how often I'm going to be doing that this time. So uh, just, yeah, just take it away. I want to start this off like I started off the episode about Forex. Trading is trading. And I use an analogy of a car. Driving is driving. And when you know how to drive, you can drive like a small car, a large car, a race car. You, The mechanics are the same, but it carries a whole bunch of risk and you got to learn different things like if you were going to drive a dump truck, yes, there's some buttons and some things you need to learn how to do. If you want to drive a stick shift, then yes, there are certain things you need to do, but pretty much the mechanics are the same. So when we get into these episodes, we're going to be talking about some of the differences psychologically that these products will bring. We talked about Forex, how great it was. We talked about all the advantages. And then we went over the disadvantages and these disadvantages were very specific to Forex. One of these things like leverage, you just didn't get a chance to lever up a hundred to one in stocks. No one has ever allowed you to do that. So leverage was a big one in Forex. I'm going to start out with the advantages of stock trading. Now for me, the number one advantage to stock trading is there is an overall bullish bias. One of the things I love about Forex is there is no bullish bearish bias. So you can't be a long-term bull. You can't be a long-term bear. It just doesn't make any sense in Forex. Forex is pure trading. You are purely trading. Hey, is this going up or down in the stock market? There absolutely is a bullish bias. Now I've really thought about this and I thought about, okay, why do we have this bullish bias? And what, what could possibly change it to where we had like 50 years of stocks going down? Well, the two things that really guarantee that the stock market is going to go up in value over time is inflation, prices going up. So look, it's not true gains, but look, if, they, if money is inflating by 3% a year and the stock market is inflating by 3% a year, that's, that's a zero, but the value is still going up. So as long as we have inflation, that prices are being pushed up, that is going to make an overall bullish price in stocks. And number two is population growth. Population growth, for the most part, will ensure that as we grow the population, there's going to be more and more consumers. The Federal Reserves around the world, they're going to be printing more money to keep up with this population growth. And because of that, earnings are going to go up over time, which means stock prices are going to go up over time. Let's talk about some of the benefits of this 
overall bullish bias. This makes it to where you really don't even have to be good at stock trading. And this is where dollar cost averaging pretty much will take away a lot of the bad investments that people make or the wrong timing that they get into because over time things will go up. And especially if you're investing in things like ETFs, if you're trading, you know, ETFs or mutual funds or things that are already diversified, it's pretty much a guarantee that if you get in at the wrong time and you hold, it's likely going to come back for you. Look, I'm not saying that's a good thing to do. That's a terrible thing to do as a trader, but people then get into dollar cost averaging where when things go against them, they buy more, they buy more, they buy more. And over time, this dollar cost averaging ends up saving lots and lots of bad decisions in investing and trading. Yeah, we've had, gosh, it's gotta be so nice for the people in the financial world, whether you're a trader or an investment advisor or an institutional banker to have pretty much the last 40 years be almost nothing but unbridled growth. Whether the stock market reflects that, it doesn't always. We have recessions and things like that. But man, I mean, you've had people who, who have had entire 40-year, 50-year careers and they're retired now who've retired rich just because they were playing the market on easy mode the entire time because it did nothing but go up. That is crazy. And, um, and the reasons you said there, Rob, do make a lot of sense. Now, I will push back a little bit on one thing, and that is going forward. Um, I think we have hit peak population. The narratives now are how is, is how like nobody's having kids um, because they can either not afford it or they just don't want to. It's a generational thing. I'm not sure what it is. But that and the demographic issues we're having now of a, of a very aging population in a lot of countries because people just stopped having kids at the same rate they were in the past. We got saved by the millennial generation in the United States, um, but a lot of countries didn't have a big millennial generation. That was something that was kind of unique to us. So uh, let's say this, this whole thing kind of turns over. Do you think, uh, just you know, put your prediction hat on, do you think this would be overall bullish for the economy or overall bearish? And would it stay that way? Would it still make it easy for traders to trade either on the way up or the way down? A decline in population growth is absolutely bearish. And here's the cool thing. We have a case study of a country that literally has done this over the past 30 years, Japan. Japan is the case study for what happens when you have a declining population and an aging population that stops spending money. Because look, when you get into your 60s and 70s, you're not spending money like you were in your 20s or 30s. Japan, they had a huge bubble in the 80s and it popped in 1990. And their stock market barely made new highs just this last year. So we're talking about 33 years of stagnation and the economy was really bad. They could not get GDP growth up above like 1%. Most of the time it was negative. They had to go in and do things to try to like stimulate people to have more kids, to have babies. They've Japan has been very, very tight on immigration. They've actually opened up on immigration a little bit. They looked and saw the problem that these declining demographics had and they didn't do anything for years. They finally started to figure this out. Now, if you want to look at another country that is headed into an absolute disaster, it's China. Look at the demographics in China. They are terrible. And look what's happening to the Chinese economy over the last year or two. We're starting to see this happen as well in China. So yeah, no, I think it's a very fascinating concept to talk about. Um, we got way off the subject on this, but you could tell I could talk about this forever. Yeah, so that, that then begs the question, I know I can do this through the use of CFDs, but let's say I'm a stock trader for Maverick. Can I, can I go short as easily as I can go long? Because I'm probably going to want to do that if this is going to be my future. It's just the button next to the buy button. It's the sell button. You just hit the sell button. If you don't own it, you go short. It's very, very simple. So yeah, understanding both sides of the market is very, very important as a trader. But in stocks, again, there is a bullish bias. And so in Forex, you can be truly unbiased. In stock trading, you have to have this bias. It will help you and it will actually make your job a little easier. 
but we know recessions happen. We got to be ready for bear markets. But for the most part, it's kind of like swimming with the current when you're on the long side in the market. Okay. So sounds easy enough. If the market is going one way, I can just follow that and chase the trend. Um, sometimes for years, that's great. So uh, let's take it from a psychological standpoint then. And when we talk about advantages, what are some advantages that will help somebody or at least ease the burden psychologically for a trader? Another positive thing about the stock market is it is, it is a game that's open for everybody. Little old grandmas, they can come into the stock market. Now, look, I'm not saying little old grandmas should be high frequency traders. But what I'm saying is they can go into the stock market and they can buy Boeing. They can buy uh, Philip Morris. They can buy the most boring businesses, the slowest businesses they could possibly find and be very, very safe. Here's the cool thing about the stock market. You can go find the craziest, dumbest stuff that's out there. And actually, in just this last week, in the Flatter Trading series that I'm doing on YouTube, where we're buying stuff randomly, on the last Friday of 2023, I said, let's trade both the best performing stock of the whole year, you know, and it was up like hundreds of percent, and let's trade the worst performing stock of the year. And the worst performing stock was a stock called Mullen Automotive. Uh, they did three reverse splits in um, 2023 because if your stock is under a dollar, the, the NASDAQ kicks you off. So they did reverse splits. Their stock went down 99.6%. That's how bad it was. But because of the re reverse stock splits, it came up on a radar and that was the one we traded. That thing trades 20% a day. That was the average through range, Patrick, 20% a day. Have you ever heard about that? Outside of crypto, no, and outside of bankrupt companies, no, I have not. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. So here's a great thing. In Forex, you know, yes, we, we know that there are some currencies that have a little bit more volatility than others. We understand that. But you don't really get to pick like super, super, super low volatility and super, super high volatility in Forex. In the stock market, you literally get to decide how much risk you want to take on. Do you want to trade the penny stocks, the crackhead stocks, I call them, to where you're trying to get that rush? Or are you going to go down the other end of the risk curve and play something really boring? And here's the cool thing that you can do with stocks is vary those. I do this all the time. When the stock market is running, I go look for high volatility. Then when the stock market stops running and starts to get a little choppy, I'll go all the way down to very low volatile stocks and play those while I'm waiting for another run to happen. So the great thing about the stock market is it gives you the opportunity to really dial up and down risk that you just don't get in Forex. So, okay, that's nice too, but I can also make the case for that being uh, not specific to stocks so much because I can in a way do that in Forex as well. Um, are there any particular psychological advantages that are specific to the stock market itself, in your opinion. One of the ones that really helped me out in the beginning were the limited hours the stock market is open. I have this as both an advantage and a disadvantage on stocks. So we're going to talk about the disadvantages in a little bit. But the advantages was the stock market was open seven and a half hours a day. I could only be an idiot for seven and a half hours a day. I couldn't trade because I was bored. I couldn't do anything. I had to wait. Now, since I started trading in the 90s, after hours trading has become more of a thing. And now you can really trade from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. And you know the, the biggest stocks, maybe the biggest two or 300 stocks are gonna have enough volume to where you still can trade them. So now you got 12 hours. They did just open up overnight trading on things like the SPY and the Qs, uh, those now do have overnight trading and the volume is actually fairly decent. So one of the things that helped me out was that I didn't have access to it all the time. And when I was young and impulsive and I didn't have my discipline down, this was a real benefit to me to where it was closed most of the time. Yeah, I can see how that would be the case, especially for an intraday 
trader um, because, you know, I've told the story a million times before. I used to be this too. And I would have to start my trading session at midnight, and, and that's no way to live. Um, so as, as people who are on the Western Hemisphere, for sure, um, this would be really nice to have. Even if you're just, maybe you're not a daily trader, maybe you're not intraday, but you're a swing trader. You know, it would be just as as conducive to a good lifestyle too. I do like that quite a bit. Uh, now, how's the liquidity over on stocks compared to Forex? And is there an advantage or a disadvantage there to you? I'm going to have to say that there is both. Just like we talked about the scale of low volatility to high volatility, every single stock is going to have different amounts of volume. Now, if you go check on Apple, Apple is going to have ridiculous volume. There's tons of volume. And so bid ask spreads are very, very tight. Orders are really, really easy to do. And it actually works pretty well when you've automated your orders to get triggered at certain points or you have stop orders. It works really, really well on the most heavily traded stocks. However, when you go down the line and you go down to stocks that don't have a lot of volume, all of a sudden now you've got bigger spreads and now you've got slippage on orders. So it, it really depends if, if you're trading high volatility or sorry, if you're trading high volume stocks, it's going to be very, very similar to, to Forex. And look, if you're trading Apple or if you're trading Euro dollar, look, unless you have like $20 billion that you're trying to move, you're going to be able to move each one easily. Each one's going to take your order easily. Once you get down to the lower volume stocks, all of a sudden it starts to become this little game where you have to hide your orders. Now we have some software that if I wanted to buy 40,000 shares, I can't just put that out there on a low volume stock. I go out and I do what's called a hide the order where I show that I want to buy 500, but I will keep buying the stock endlessly until I get to my full basket that I wanted. So yes, High, vo high volume stocks, it's going to be just as easy in Forex to get a fill. Lower volume stocks, definitely a little bit more difficult. And those stocks are dangerous to automate your orders to where, you know, when you have stop orders or you have other kind of orders, you do get a lot more slippage on those. Yeah, I can kind of co-sign on that too, because I don't do it often, but I will play into some of the really lower cap mining stocks. Or I have before, and then you have to maintain them as well. And especially during the maintenance part, usually when you buy them, you can buy them close to when you want them because if the spread's out of control, you can just kind of wait and it'll get back to normal. But then when you want to take some kind of profit or if you want to bail and you don't want to sit around and wait for price to get worse, sometimes there is nobody there to take your order, which is really, really frustrating and nerve wracking at the same time. So I guess, you know, the moral of the story is if you're really going to trade, you're probably not going to trade those too often um, because who really wants to deal with that you know that's such a luxury we have in forex to where we get our orders filled immediately almost all the time uh, but yeah that seems like something that's pretty easy to avoid uh, now, now there's one that i added on as far as the advantages go and this is for anybody out there who is considering maybe selling your trades or selling yourself as somebody who's good at this there is a really big and robust market out there for you. Um, now, if you're doing the same thing with Forex trades, there is also a big market, but you're dealing with the entire globe. And most of the globe probably cannot afford your product. To where, let's be honest, in the stock picking world, it's very Western centric, especially United States and Canada. And chances are most of the people you market to, if they wanted to, would be able to afford your product. So there is a really nice little, I want to say, um, opportunity zone here for somebody who has gotten good at stock trading and can actually prove it. You know, you can go to a place like Maverick and do it on a prop firm level, or you can go independent, or you can do both. You know, Rob, I've spoken to Rob on this before. Rob is always fine with, you know, people being entrepreneurial and going out and staking their own claim too. So there's some real opportunity that I don't think many Forex and crypto traders really consider that is a real untapped resource. If you are good at technical analysis, you will probably be very good at stock trading, especially if there is a daily bias, like Rob just said, that just works in your favor even more. And I think there's some real missed opportunity out there for some no-nonsense Forex traders, especially who have gotten really good at trading, but who ignore stocks. 
as I said earlier, trading is trading. It's really the same mechanics. If you haven't ever traded stocks before, there's going to be some new buttons that you have to learn in the car. There's going to be maybe another lever you have to figure out. But if you can, if you can chart well and you can build a system and you can follow that system, trading is trading. It doesn't matter what you're doing. And I would really recommend to do all of them. And we've recommended that in this podcast before. Uh, what I love, I tell people, I'm like a moth to flame. I've got all these markets I trade. And sometimes the Forex market isn't that good. And they say, fine, I'll go play over here. I'll go play over here where the volatility and the trends are better. And I'll play over there. And then all of a sudden that doesn't get as good. And then I say, oh, Forex has picked back up again. Let me jump back in over here. It allows you to find the market condition that matches up with your trading system. Remember, we've talked about your trading system is going to do better in one kind of market than another. If you've built a trend following system, then you want to be trading in the market that is currently experiencing the biggest trend. If you have all these markets to pick from, you can probably match up your strategy better with that market and have more consistent returns. So it all sounds good. Sounds like a really great opportunity, but I will bet there are disadvantages to this as well, and people should be aware of them before going this route. So what disadvantages do you have um, after we've already covered all the advantages? There is one disadvantage that is so absolutely terrible. Most people, when they find out about this, they say, no thanks. And that is what's called a gap. Because the stock market is closed for the majority of the day, there are news events that are happening all the time. Let's say there's a company that uh, was at $50 a share. And it closed at $50 a share. And you said, oh, my stock that I own is $50 a share. When it opens up tomorrow, it's going to be at $50 a share. No, it's not. No, it's not. If that company comes out and there's any bad news on it, like they, they are being investigated by the SEC, I've seen stocks gap 80 to 90%. I've, I've seen stocks gap to virtually zero. When you are trading stock, there is absolutely no way to protect yourself from that. There's no way to moderate that. Look, if you know how to trade options, you can buy some options to create some hedges. But if you're purely stock trading, there is a chance that sometime in your life, you will open up and the trade that you're making or the investment you made has gapped against you significantly and you have lost all the money that you had in that. So if you had too big of a position size, you could the theoretically lose all your money overnight. That's terrifying. From someone who, who's really serious about risk management, the thought of that even being a possibility, uh, that keeps me up at night. So that's the biggest, biggest reason, uh, psychological reason. And so what this does, I, I know that like going into weekends, I know that there are stock traders that will sell their positions that are doing really well, but they can't hack the thought of two and a half days of worrying about news coming out, especially when you're in a period of time where there is lots of news. I remember um, back in, well, I want to say 2007, maybe 2009. I can't remember what it was, but there was a big tsunami in Japan. There was a big earthquake that caused a big tsunami that basically hit one of their nuclear reactors. And over the weekend, there was a chance that there would be a full blown meltdown. Can you imagine holding your positions over the weekend with that? I mean, Patrick, do you have a rule for holding positions over the weekend in Forex? So you're talking about Fukushima, which, yeah, if you were a uh, uranium mining stockholder, that was a pretty harrowing time for you because you're right, that did happen on a weekend, didn't it? Yeah, that would be something. Now, now with Forex, I used to get this question a lot. Now, I'm sure I was getting it from stock traders. And I, again, I, used to, I probably got this at least once a week before I addressed it on a podcast episode, then I got it a lot less. But they're like, well, what about gapping? Is this something you ever worry about? I'm like, in Forex? No, I really don't worry about it. Because, okay, it can happen on the weekend. But one, it's very rare. 
And two, when it does happen, there's a much better than average chance that it's not going to happen to a currency that you're involved with. And then three, gaps can all also happen in your favor just as easily as they can happen against you. So if you factor all those things in, I really don't worry about gaps in Forex. And so I can imagine, yeah, quite a, really something you would want to avoid in stock trading, especially because if I did it, I wouldn't be trading intraday. I would be definitely holding over the weekend. Well, let me tell you what happened with Fukushima. And again, I just want to paint this picture of, of psychologically, imagine you've got your money on the line and we're going into the weekend. On Friday, you have to decide, am I going to hold over the weekend where we might have a nuclear meltdown? And guess what happened? Over the weekends, they figured it out. And by Monday, the stock market was gapping up higher. That kind of fear causes you to take actions that are outside of your trading plan because they're such incredible events. They're such incredible events. The right answer, is, as Patrick said, is to just hold through them. Know that some will go for you, some will go against you. Make sure you have your position sizing right. You can hold through these events if you're trading it the right way. And actually, we did a study at Maverick. I want to say this was back in, I think we took from 1990 to 2010. My premise was, if you're trading with the trend, you get more gaps for you than against you. So that was my premise. And so I wanted to see, okay, what are the odds? So I was thinking about a predictable, measurable thing we could do, and it was earnings. So in this um, exercise, we did not exercise, but we, we did some back testing and we did it over all 500 S&P stocks for the last 20 years. And we simulated if you bought the stock that was in an uptrend and the way we uh, calculated uptrend was, was it above the 50 day moving average or was the price of the stock below the 50 day moving average? So that was our premise. We went long at 3.59 and 59 seconds p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So basically the last trade of the day. And then the earnings would come out either that night or in the next morning. And then we'd sell it at uh, like 9.31. So one minute after the market opened. So we went back and ran all the data for all 500 S&P stocks. And what we found out that there was a 59% win-loss ratio in the favor of being long and uptrending stock into earnings or being short a downtrending stock into earnings. Here was the interesting thing. The bullish side had a profit factor of about 1.3. So it was right more than wrong and it had a profit factor of 1.3. Um, the bearish side had a profit factor of 1.9, meaning it was better to be short downtrending stocks going into an earnings report. You actually got the bigger moves in your favor. So, if you were looking at trading, not as a singular event, but as a thing you're going to do for the rest of your life, understand that these gaps are going to go for you and against you. If you're using correct position size, they're going to sting sometimes, but guess what? There's been plenty of times where I woke up in my trade that I thought that was going to go from 30 to 31. Uh, the company was bought out for $55. That's really nice to wake up to in the morning. So look, they can go for you and against you. Position sizing is so important. Okay, so it is a disadvantage psychologically probably, but overall, if you do it right, doesn't have to be. Okay, so that's good. Uh, now I'm looking at the our outline here, Rob, and uh, for the next disadvantage, you, uh, it looks like you hit the copy-paste button on one of the actual advantages. Can, can you please explain? Yes, we talked about the seven and a half hour marketplace. And this is also a disadvantage. It's a disadvantage because one of the things we pointed out that was great about stock trading, it fits in very well with the nine to five part of life. Fits in very, very well. Forex does not fit within that parameter. And based on your lifestyle, um, Forex trading might be very, very difficult for you to do. Whereas uh, let's say you've got like a family and you've got other things and your kids are gone from you know 8 a.m. till 3.30 in the afternoon. And again, everything is more normal in stock trading, but it's, it's a very limited amount of time. So it doesn't always give you the ability 
to work it into your schedule. If let's say you have a, a nine to five job where you're not allowed to look on your phone and make trades, stock trading is going to be absolutely impossible. You can't do it. You just can't do it. It's also bad for extroverts. Now, again, I've told you I'm a very big extrovert. And my first couple years of trading, I hated the weekends. Absolutely hated it. The second those blinky lights went off at 4 p.m. Eastern time on Friday, I was depressed. Couldn't wait. And I was that guy. And again, I, I now, whenever I see this from one of my Forex traders, I send them an email. The Forex market opens up at 5.15 Eastern time at Interactive Brokers, which is who we trade through. Whenever I see a trader that gets into a trade at 516, I know they've been waiting all weekend. As soon as it wakes up, as soon as the market opens up, they're in it. Why? Not because it was a good trade, because the spreads are awful. It's because they couldn't handle it. In the stock market, it makes it even worse for extroverts. So if that's going to be an, an issue for you, this is not the market. You want to go to some other markets. And if you're unsure if you're an extrovert or an introvert as it pertains to life or trading itself, you go back to episode two down below in the show notes. We have a test for you to take that will tell you just that. I think most of you probably know already, but if you're unsure, if you're on the fence, that is a place you can go. Now, I will say too, I almost thought a disadvantage too would have been that this is a very Western Hemisphere centric thing. But no, I mean, there's there's robust markets you can trade in Europe. There's very robust markets you can trade in Asia and Australia. So th this pretty much can go for just about anybody in the world, regardless of where you are. Um, just one disadvantage I added kind of towards the end is when I always see people trading stocks, they usually have a news feed on in the background, like a Bloomberg or a CNBC or something like that going. To me, Rob, I, I can see the advantage so you can kind of stay on top of like rogue news that might come out of nowhere. But I have always thought it's just better to shut that thing off and just, you know, you know me, you know, trade your system and, and kind of ignore everything else and don't let these external factors affect you so much. What is your take on that? I've got a great story for this take. I used to be a news hound. I love news. And it was always like, here's the news. And it would, I'd have to think about what it meant. And then I would go see if I could take some action on it. Um, and I really love to trade the non-farm payrolls report, which is the first Friday of every month. I'd been trading for a few years and I was in, I ended up up in Canada one time for the first uh, Friday of the month. And I was going to trade the payrolls report. And usually I would have CNBC on and they would tell me the numbers. I would look at the chart and I would, I would take in the data, the numbers into my brain. And then I'd take a look at the first price action. And then I'd somehow try to figure out what was the most likely to happen and then try to make a trade off that. Here was the problem up in Canada. Sorry, Canada, but you already know this. Your TV is terrible. It's gotten better. I go to Canada quite a bit. I've got some friends up there. Your TV has gotten better. But 20 years ago, your TV was terrible. And I couldn't find any, any channel that had this news. And I realized, oh my gosh, I have to trade without the news. And so all I did was just trade the price action. So I traded the price action, I ended up making a decent trade, made some money, and I turned my computer off and I left for the day. At the end of the day, I realized I didn't even know if the employment report was good or bad. I didn't know what the numbers were. And I realized having the news on was hurting me. So for the next couple of years, I would always turn off the TV before the employment report came out because I didn't want that stimulus. I wanted to purely trade price action. So I'm a huge believer with you uh, that news feeds are, are terrible. They're going to get you to think. They're going to get you to feel. And again, it's thoughts lead to feelings. Feelings lead to actions. T-L-A. If that news gets you to think, you're going to start to feel fear. You're going to start to feel something. And that is what caused you to take action, which is not what your plan was all set up for. Was for you to take action off of a a thought. So yeah, news is a huge thing in the stock market. It's not a huge thing in Forex, uh, except around, you know, little events, but it's a huge thing in the stock market. I highly recommend you cancel all of that. Just trade the price action on the chart.
Again, just trade your system. Just trade your system. Whatever you decided, this is your entry points. Nothing on a TV, nothing on a newspaper should make you change that whatsoever. Yeah, I would have to second that. Just from my experience uh, with news in the Forex world, too, I'm sure, I'm sure it's way worse in stocks. But a lot of times, I'm sure this happens there, too, you'll have news that's very positive, and then the stock goes down. And then the the same news people will come back and try to explain it away like, oh, it was already priced in or, oh, we have these other headwinds over here. And it's like, well, why didn't you say that before the news event came out? Why are you saying it after the fact? That always really frustrated me. And that just, you know, made me just hit the quit button on news altogether. So I'm glad to hear you say that. Yeah. If, um, yeah. This just goes for anything, guys. Take all that external stuff out and just trade your system. It's, it's going to be a hundred times better. So. One last thing I see is that certain stocks get this cult of personality. And look, I'm going to say stuff like Tesla, NVIDIA. And what happens is people get attached to these stocks like they're friends. Well, I made a lot of money on NVIDIA, so I'm going to trade NVIDIA next time. Like that's the dumbest thing in the world. And, and they get to know about, oh, the CEO. I really like the CEO or I don't like the CEO. When I first started trading, I could never go long a company that had slighted me in any way or if I didn't like their product. If I didn't like their product, they were only short candidates. If I liked their product, I could only go long. I could never go short. And the first time I broke this was when TiVo, now I'm really dating myself. Those of you that are older will know, TiVo was the first chance to never watch a commercial when you're watching TV. It was awesome. You didn't need a VCR or anything. It was awesome. And I, we loved our TiVo. And TiVo stock came up as a short. And before then, I couldn't short a stock that I loved, the company. And this time I said, yeah, but this is such a good short. So I shorted TiVo. It went down. I made some money. And when I got out of it, I still like TiVo. And I realized, oh, I don't have to connect the two. Just because I love Elon Musk, I can still be short Tesla. Or guess what? If I hate Elon Musk, I can be long Tesla. But with stocks, we attach all these strings to these stocks and they don't mean anything. The price is either going to go up or down based on supply and demand. But you think I've done research on this company. I, I drive a Tesla or I, I, I use this kind of device. All that stuff leads you to be biased and it's really, really negative in the market of trading. So this again, one of the biggest disadvantages of stocks is People get married, people get attached to these things, people think they know this or this. Look, it's just a symbol. That's all it is. So those are the disadvantages of stocks. As I said, it should be something you do, probably not the only thing you do. Yeah, and something you said too, yeah, never let anybody you know who also trades stocks influence you. Your average home trader is, is usually way, way, way in the hole that they did really well on one stock. And that's always the story you're going to hear, how they did really well on Tesla or something like that. They will always omit all the futility they had and all the times they lost their ass and how, how actually in the, the red their overall account is. Because most people you talk to who, uh, quote, dabble in the stock market, that's typically where they are. So just don't let those people get you all excited about trading. Uh, that's, that's one thing I've learned over time too. Now, Kind of wrapping, starting to wrap things up here, I should say. Uh, what are the things that just people need to consider overall when they ask themselves the question, is this a route I should take? Because I feel like it's, it's, um, it's, it's a big investment in time and effort and money and psychology as well. You know, this is not a step that everybody wants to take. But the question is, should they? And if that answer is yes, what are some things they have to really take into consideration before making that step? Great question. And I'm definitely going to ruffle some feathers here, which I love to do because I, I push and I'm kind of a jerk about some certain things that I want people to change. And this is going to be one of them. Look, uh, a stock is just a symbol. Everything is just a symbol. And sometimes symbols go up and sometimes symbols go down. So yeah, there's no reason to not trade stocks. Once you fully understand the vehicle and you understand how to handle gaps and stuff like that, it's, it's just like a car. But the last disadvantage I talked about is very real. And whenever I see people with watch lists, oh my gosh, I go bananas. A watch list, no, no, look, 20, 25 years ago, you had to have a watch list, which meant 
you know, I had a watch list. I had 30 stocks on this watch list. And every so often I'd add a new one. Ooh, this is my new one I'm going to put on my watch list. And then every so often I'd kick one out. Ugh, I don't like this one anymore. And these 30 stocks I would watch. And that's all I would trade. Because it's all I could see. It's all I was in front of me. Now they have scanning and screener programs. Uh, we use Finviz. Finviz is free. It's awesome. Uh, you basically say, I want a stock that's trading 10% above its 20-day moving average with an RSI going up of 60 and that is greater than 2 million shares a day in volume and this is this. You click a button and it gives you seven. That's how you need to trade stocks. If you have a watch list, throw it away. And like I said, I know that I'm ruffling some feathers here. I know some of you, you got your watch list. You got your stocks. You got, and I know there's Microsoft on there. I know there's Tesla. I know there's Nvidia. I know it. Having that watch list is biasing you so much. You don't even realize it. Ditch your stock watch list. Figure out what you're going to trade. Go to a screener. If Microsoft pops up on the screener, trade it but you don't start there. So that's my biggest thing. I really want to get to people who are looking to trade stocks. Do not have a watch list because you will get somehow connected to those and think they're special when they're just as simple. Never have a watch list. Use screeners. There's my rant, Ray Patrick. I did not expect that answer at all. I thought you were going to go way down a psychological rabbit hole <laughs> that, I, that I would probably expect you to go down, but that was completely unexpected, but great advice nonetheless. Yeah, I think one of the biggest themes in this episode is how people just get married to stocks because of the story or because it's how it's treated them in the past. And that's one of the re really big things that just takes them out from the start. Um, so good. No, I'm actually glad you, you brought that up. Now, my last question before we completely close down here is, do you have no-nonsense Forex traders in your stock division over at Maverick? We absolutely do. But let me just tell you this. We don't trade a lot of stocks. Um, we use stocks as a way to hedge out our options positions. Um, look, we have some pure stock traders. They're, I'd say less than 5% of Maverick traders are pure stock traders. Uh, we, use, we use stocks as hedges to options positions. Interesting, and a bit of a foreshadowing to our next episode. But until then, thank you everybody for joining us here at the Trading Psychology Podcast. Rob and I will both see you next week. Goodbye, everybody.